yo yo checking in again another day another message it's been a while since i dropped a video like this so i thought i'll put another one out there to get people to think talk discuss but also to use this video as a means of inspiration and motivation or how people see fit um the topic today we're going to be talking about education a lot of people ask me when i speak at conferences i go to schools people referral units are going to prisons a lot of people say craig how did you get to the point that you are right now what did you do in school? What were some of your pitfalls? What were some of your highs and your lows? So I thought I'd put a video out there to get people to use it and share amongst each other, etc, etc. So my story, my story is not unique. It's not extravagant or compared to some other people that are out there. It's, it's pr practically the same. I went to a school in inner city Birmingham, um, St. Francis School. Um, as I remember, that was probably my most fun times. Growing up as a child, you know, I was at top sets, um, maths, English and science. I had a passion for science, um, geography and history. I was always an inquisitive person. Always wanted to learn about certain things. Um, my mum and dad, um, in terms of my background, I lived with mum and dad, my older brother. Mum um, and dad were always into education. For those that know my family, my family are, are well-known community activists within the Birmingham community, historically and also now. Um, so I've always been around people that have wanted to empower our people in our community and people that were interested in education. So I was always inquisitive. I used to get sent to Saturday school every Saturday. Um, as long as I remember, I used to hate it because I used to always think that, why is my dad sending me to an extra day of school? But I see the benefit in it now. I used to go to 104 and heat for a row for those that know about 104. Um, and we used to learn a lot about our African history, who we were, where we came from, and not just the, the same type of information that we often hear about in school, that we were slaves, we were in bondage, we were always begging for our rights, etc, etc. So we'd always learn about history that, that was thousands of years before those incidents had happened, when we were kings, when we were queens, um, the legacies that we left. Um, the wealth that we had as, indiv as individuals, as societies, the different parts of the world that we explored, we conquered, we created a lot of different things. So I was always upon that understanding and knowledge about who I was and about my history. And also I was, um, I also used to get extra support in my maths, English and science. I used to always find maths difficulty, uh, but I'll explain that a little bit later. So primary school was my best years, um, as I can remember. Going into secondary school, I went to a school called Cardinal Newman School, um, which is kind of like borderline um, Winston Green going into Baywood. Um, again, when I landed school year seven, I was fine. Um, no issues, again, at the top set. I think when I got to year eight, year nine, that's when I kind of started to experience a lot of difficulty. Again, that was the age when I started to define my masculinity, trying to understand who I was as a man. And again, we were kind of surrounded by a lot of individuals that were negative. I guess the area that I came from um, in Hockley, it wasn't as bad as some of the things that we hear about now, but it was in an area where we used to see little things take place, people getting involved in, 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 in gangs, people robbing people, fights, etc. And I guess for many young people that live in the inner city, a lot of these things become normal. It's seen as something that is part and part of inner city life. So in year seven, so year eight, year nine, I guess I started to find some difficulty. When I got to probably year nine, that's when I really kind of shifted from the top set to the bottom set. Um, because at the school that I was, to be in the bottom set, it was fun, it was cool to be those individuals that messed about. My dad used to call it the class clown. He used to always say to me, the class clown is never gonna make it in life. And I guess I chose that when I got to year nine, that education, wasn't as inspiring as I found Saturday school because at that stage I stopped going Saturday school as I was a lot older at that particular point. Um, I found that the teachers didn't really understand who I was as a person. I found myself being very, um, I was always in conflict with teachers, predominantly in, predominantly in English, predominantly in history, predominantly in geography, predominantly in RE. Again, because I was brought up on information, I was brought up on knowledge that contradicted a lot of the information that that the curriculum was giving me. So I'd always find teachers in RE, in history, in science, always in some sort of battle. 
So I was always labelled as someone that was being aggressive, someone that's being intimidating, rather than having a teacher that was willing to challenge or allow me to even speak on my thoughts and share that with others in the group. So I'd always find that difficulty within school. When I got to year 10, I guess I got to that point where I weren't interested in education at all. I was more interested in um, wagging school, not attending sessions. I was more interested in being girls, more interested in bringing fireworks into school and causing trouble. And those things almost came part and part of daily life at Cardinal Newman School. Anybody knows about Cardinal Newman School, it got closed in 2001. Um, because in terms of Ofsted, it wasn't meeting certain things. And I remember even when Ofsted inspectors used to come to the school, people would be playing cards, people were throwing snowballs at these teachers. And it just got to a point where school wasn't really school. When I see school nowadays and I think about school and I went to school, it weren't the same. I mean, people just weren't paying attention. We'd have supply teachers coming in every other week. Um, people were getting into fights with supply teachers, teachers were, teachers were attacking young people. All kind of madness was going on in school and I guess I never went home and told my mum about these issues and for me, I guess I just accepted that this is how school was. And I remember when I got to year 11 when it came to options, I remember because of my behaviour, I remember a lot of teachers chose my subjects for me. So a lot of people choose options of what they want to do. And I, got, I had to choose my options. So I remember I got chose um, my teacher chose drama, child development. I don't think I was allowed to do double science because of my behaviour. But I think there were the three options. I mean, nowadays there's so many options you can do now. But when I was at school, there weren't many options that you could choose. And I remember I was assigned a mentor, and that mentor had to sit with me in my class, in most of my classes, because of my behaviour. And the funny thing is, I never used to tell my mum and dad all of these things that used to go on in school. I remember that they used to send letters home and I remember the postman used to come to the house at about 20 past eight. So when I knew that I was gonna get suspended or I was gonna get in trouble by the teacher or get a detention or whatever, I'd purposely wake up late that morning and I'd get the, uh, the letter, I'd open it, read it, and depending on what it said, um, I used to uh, just go back to school and then say to my teacher, yeah, that my mum spoke to me, my dad spoke to me and whatnot. And, uh, Again, that just became part and part of the thing, and I remember parents' evening, I remember every parents' evening that I have, I had. My mum cried at every single parents' evening. I don't remember not one parents' evening where my mum didn't cry. And it's interesting because I'm going to talk about something later that's quite significant in regards to that. So I remember every, every, every parents' evening, my mum crying, saying, Craig, what's wrong with you? What's your problem? You know, we, we, we help you, we support you. Why don't you want to behave yourself at school? And I, and I never knew. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it is, I guess it was just my choice that I wanted to behave a particular way and the way that the school was set up, nobody was being challenged and it just became part and part of the culture and I kind of find it, I find it hard to kind of get myself out of that particular habit of just doing random things within the classroom or in the corridors or outside of the school. So when I got to year 11 again, it was, it was time to study and revise for our GCSEs and I'll be totally honest, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't revise at all. I was one of them people that I thought that I can try and wing it. Um, I try and just do the test and see how it goes on that day. And then I remember even in the, the exam hall, I was burping, I was throwing paper, I was making noise. And I remember the teacher saying to us that, you know, if we make one more noise, we're gonna get kicked out. And I remember at that time, I, just, I, I just didn't care. And I remember I had a conversation with my dad and he said to me, the funny thing is that all of the friends that you're messing about with and you're playing with, all of those individuals are going to have A's and B's. And you know when you're mumbling under your breath, you think you know it all and you think you know better than your parents. And I was just mumbling, kind of saying, you know what? Yeah, whatever. And I'll never forget the day on GCSE days, you know, when you get that brown envelope. I remember that day came and all the parents came. I think my mum and dad couldn't make because they had work or whatever. And I remember I got my envelope and all the same friends that I was messing about with every single day, all of them opened up their, their, their envelopes and people were getting A's, B's, C's, two C's, four C's, two B's, two A's, five C's. And I opened up mine and I remember I got A for drama. That was the only session that I had a mentoring. And then I got... E's, F's, G's, and I think the rest of them was all unclassified. And I just remembered everything that my dad said to me at that particular moment, it's like it came true. 
And I remember my friends laughing at me, laughing in my face like, yo, how could you got that? How could you got them marks? And I was thinking, but all you man was messing about with me, so I thought that we weren't revising together. And the reality was that I was one of the only few out of people that left with no GCSEs. And there was many others as well, but I just remember that particular point. So then obviously I was in a dilemma because I wanted to go to college. I wanted to get into college and all of the criteria that I needed in order to get to courses that I wanted to do, I couldn't do it. So the best thing that I did was I went to work with my brother. My brother's working at a local warehouse in the community. So I was just packing and picking, but it didn't really satisfy me because I've always been interested in education, even though that I used to mess about. I was always interested in education. So I applied to go to a couple of colleges, got rejected. Um, but at that particular time, I got, my mum moved out of Hockley because at that particular time, it, the area kind of started to get, it went from bad to worse. You had people that were living in the area that were, were bringing their own individuals into the area. Um, you had people selling, you had people, just getting into all kind of madness outside. I can remember every summer there was a fight. Every summer there was some sort of madness between my next door neighbor with another next door neighbor or someone that lived across the road. And I guess my mom just got to a point where my mum and dad got to a point where they didn't want to live or they wanted, didn't want to grow me and my brother up in that type of environment. So we moved to Handsworth Wood. Now for me, at that particular point, it was a big shock because I moved from an area where men are fighting, men are playing tracking, men are playing Royal Rumble, men are playing curbs, to an area where people just want to play basketball and people want to play cricket. And I was just, it was just a big shock for me. So what I was doing was I was, even though I was living at that house, I decided to live with my auntie for about a year and a, a year and a half, and that was at the time when I was in during year eleven, going into college. Um, and at that particular time, I had another mentor that was supporting me in terms of um, just in terms of my development and just in terms of <clears throat> things that I just found and I had difficulties with. And one of the things that I got introduced to was basketball. Now I picked up basketball quite quick. Um, I started enjoying basketball, I started to go basketball, and I found that basketball became like an event because I found at that time I, I kept getting caught up in stupid things. Someone would call me stupid and I'd kick off and I'd always get caught up in some sort of madness because of some little petty argument. But I found that basketball was kind of my vent. It kind of allowed me to kind of do other things. It kind of allowed me to, you know, make certain choices. So I was playing basketball Monday to Friday. Saturday, Sunday, I'd be away playing games and whatnot, and I kind of enjoyed it. I was playing for Birmingham Excel at the time. I was playing for Birmingham Bullets under 21s. So I was playing for both teams. <clears throat> so, in essence, even though I wasn't in education, I was still doing something positive, so to speak. Um, so because I was playing basketball, I was playing for the best team in the city at the time. I had the opportunity to go and study at Sutton Coalfield College and I couldn't do a national diploma, I had to do a BTEC first, which is like the, the, like the bare minimal um, course that you could go on. So I got into a BTEC first, um, I'd done that course, I started doing a course and it was in drama. Um, I kind of enjoyed it because it was kind of something that I'd done in school, I enjoyed it, I kind of, it was a thing that I could kind of express myself in. So that was what I kind of ended up doing. Um, then when I got to probably the last year of my first year, I was, I was finding myself into some more difficulty in the sense that I was in class, I'd get caught up in petty arguments and then it got to a situation where I had a fight within the classroom and I threatened the teacher and threatened everybody else in the classroom. And due to that situation, I made the decision that I wanted to leave the college because the environment wasn't nice. People weren't really respecting me the same and and I just chose to leave. So because I was good at basketball, when every college wanted me, so I chose to go to Matthew Bolton College, the old Matthew Bolton um, in Highgate, before they built the new one in Birmingham City Centre. And, you know, I kind of just went there and done the bare minimum. I didn't go there because I wanted to do sport. Um, I done it because it was easy for me to get on. They didn't ask any questions. I more asked about was I willing to play for their basketball team. And at the time, the coach that was coaching me for that team became the coach of that particular college. So again, I just done the bare minimal, got through, interested in training. My intention was going to America, I had ambitions to, I had ambitions to get a scholarship, and that's all I wanted to do. But my dad used to always be in my ears and say to me, yo, what about if you get an injury? What about if 
you play one day, something happens, and then you don't have basketball no more. You know, what are you going to do then? And at the time, again, I used to have that mindset, like, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I know better. I'm not going to get injured, etc., etc. And lo and behold, two years after that, in the National Cup final, um, I was playing against um, a team, I think it was Wolverhampton College, and I ruptured my anterior cruciate ligament in my right knee, which, which meant I had to have a reconstruction on my knee. Um, so, in terms of that injury, it put me out of the sport. And I can remember at that particular point, I was the most depressed individual on the planet. Because you got to remember, I've left school, no qualifications, struggled to get into college, got into college, done a year, about to go into my second year, messing about, got into an altercation, left, gone back into another college, now got injury. So then for me, I was just like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what path to take. I was just kind of like, what do I do now? So I think at that particular point, that's when I kind of started moving with the wrong set of people, started to hang around with the wrong groups of people. I started to get involved in things that I'm not proud of. And I guess at that particular time, I still had my dad in my, in my corner saying that, yo, son, you need to get back into something. You need to do something. You need to do something positive. You need to get back into education. And he introduced me to one of his friends, or like a family friend. This person's like family. Um, his name was Wesai. And I remember he used to work at the information, sh information shop in Birmingham City Centre. And anyway, this Wesai used to invite me to his workplace. We used to sit and talk. And then I had the opportunity to meet a couple of his other colleagues, Yasmin, um, Christine. And I used to always say that, you know what, you'd be a good youth worker. You know, you'll be, you'll be somebody that is interested in working with young people and uh, they'd think that I was good. And I was like, nah, I'm not really interested in working with young people. I used to coach young people, but I only did it for money. I didn't have no interest in doing it. It was something that I seen members of my family doing. My mum and dad was into working with young people and stuff. It was something that I did not want to do. So anyway, after some convincing, um, they put me on a little course, and the course was in Newtown Community Centre. I think it was the introduction to youth leaders or something like that. And I think at that particular time, I was like, you're mad, I'm not going to Newtown. Because at that particular time, when we were growing up in an area, it's strange that you don't actually have a beef with anybody that lives in another area, but you're told don't go there because them people live there, but I never ever had a problem with a, with a person, so I used to find myself not wanting to go to educate myself in certain areas because of what I was always told. And it's mad because a lot of people are fed this, this misinformation about this postcode, that postcode, and the reality is most youths don't have, have, have a beef with anybody. So anyway, after some convincing, they used to send me in taxis. Imagine that, they used to send me in taxis to go to this course, and when I got there, Again, I realised I didn't have no problems with anyone because the mad thing was I used to actually go to St. Francis School where most of my friends were from Newtown and some of them are still my friends now. But anyway, went to the school, um, sorry, went to the community centre, was engaging in all of these um, activities and I kind of thought that, you know, this youth work thing's all right. So I went on from course to course to course around youth work, dealing with difficult young people. Any course around young people was something that I, I was interested in and I just jumped on it. So I was doing a range of short courses at the same time I was finishing my second year of my sports national diploma. And then Wesai said to me, um, he said, you know what, you should try to get to university. And I was like, nah, uni's just not my thing. You know what I mean? I don't think I can get to university. And I said, you know what, you should try it, you should try it. So again, after some more convincing, I remember Yasmin and Christine actually writing my application form. I remember I applied for the Montford University, Stoke, and I think Birmingham University at the time. And the only person that got back to me was the Montford University. And I remember going for the interview and I remember saying to myself that, you know what, if I get there and I can talk, I'll be fine. And I went there and I was just honest with them. I said, on paper, you can see that in terms of my educational experience, I haven't really got the grades to get onto the course, but from what I know, what I've been exposed to my experience, I believe it can benefit people on the course and it also can benefit the lecturers. And by the grace of God, they allowed me to jump on it. And I was like, yo, I couldn't believe it. Because at that time, you got to think, all of these times I was always facing failure. I was always facing people saying, nah, you can't get on because you didn't have the academic or the qualifications in order to get on and they let me get on the course. So I moved up to Leicester. I was living um, in Leicester, going to the Montford University. And 
I would kind of say I was still involved in certain things. I was kind of living like a, a double life. So I was going to university Monday to Thursday, but then from Thursday to Sunday, I was getting involved in certain groups. And I'm not going to act like I was some bad man. I was this wild geezer, but I was getting involved in dumb things, stolen cars, fights, just mad things, just getting involved in, in a range of different things that I'm not going to talk about because I'm not proud of, but I was getting involved in stupid things. And then, cut a long story short, I think going into my second year at university, I got caught in a conflict on altercation um, with some family members where, for me, it kind of put us in a situation where we could have lost our lives. I'm not going to go into the details, but to the point where we could have lost our lives. And at that particular point, I said to myself that I need to have something different. I need to want something different for myself. And at that particular point, I just kind of stopped doing certain things. I started hanging around with certain groups of people. And I just said to myself that, you know what, for the next three to four years, I'm going to dedicate myself. And that's exactly what I did. You know, I found a mentor. I remember at the time, Dr. Carlton Housing at DeMontford University. Always got a shout out, Carlton. But he became my mentor and he really kind of, in my opinion, he kind of connected me to my childhood, connected me to all of the information and the knowledge that I kind of threw away that was beneficial, but I wasn't utilizing it. I remember him and another mentor at the time, Kemi Falarin, those two people. And just everything that they used to teach me in terms of understanding me in terms of a person and understanding the world. And I remember doing a session with Kemi around identity and we went around a small circle and I remember this. She asked everybody in the group, what were their names and what does it mean? And at that time, I had people from Carib the different parts of Caribbean, different parts of Africa. And everybody was going around the room saying what their name was, what it meant to them. And when it got to me, I was just like, my name's Craig. And for some strange reason, it bothered me. And at that particular point, I kind of reconnected back into a lot of the, the things that I was taught at 104. I was taught at Marcus Garvey Center. I was taught at... At, at, at Huckley Port and all of the things that I used to do as a young person and I found myself wanting to travel I went to Africa I went to Asia I went to so many different places to try and learn about who I am and what I was and one of the things that stuck out to me was the story of Malcolm X I mean reading his biography it really kind of touched me in the sense that this was an individual that that lived a certain lifestyle and got incarcerated and was a master of words, became a master of words because he memorized um, the dictionary and memorized words in the dictionary. So when he was conversing with people, he was an individual that, that, that he could just blow you away with, with, his, with his words in a way that he would demonstrate a particular point or an argument. And from that, I kind of found myself going into certain groups, um, certain belief systems and really kind of, in my sense, gave me kind of a new foundation, a new moral compass of the way that I was going to live my life. Again, I went to Africa, I came back, I embraced the faith of Islam, and the things were starting to change, the, my behaviours, my, the things, my, my, my behaviour towards my parents, my behaviour towards people, and I guess I just wanted to live a life that was clean-hearted, that wasn't hypocritical, and I think at that particular point, I just strived. I was working with Carlton quite closely and I strived. And I remember my third year of university, I remember finishing um, my last module. And I remember, you know, a couple months later, I found out that I got, a, um, got my certificate, I passed. And I remember my family put together a little get together. And, and I remember my mom crying. And it, it touched me because as I said earlier, every time before that, I can always remember my mum crying because something that I'd done negative at school because I didn't want to hear, I didn't want to listen to her or my dad. And I seen my mum cry again and it was at a time when I'd done something positive. So for me, when I actually think about my educational experience, one of the main things that always stick out to me is one, that I had my dad in my corner, constantly on me. Number two, I had a mentor, I had mentors that was always willing to support me. And number three, I chose, I chose to do something different. 
And I think at that particular point, I then decided that I wanted to continue my path of education. After that, I went into work for a couple of years. I was working in a local community. People know that I managed a couple of youth centers in the community. And then I met another mentor, Martin Glynn, Raymond Douglas, and those two people again inspired me again to continue in terms of my education. So then I chose to do a master's degree. I didn't think I was going to do a master's degree, but I'd done a master's degree. I'd done a master's degree in criminology, and that master's degree enabled me to, you know, think a little bit differently. I wanted to really specify my work because my first degree in youth and community development was was broad, but the, the degree in criminology, in my opinion, the master's degree in criminology, really made me specify who I wanted to work with. And that was young people that live in our communities that are disaffected, young people that are, people are frightened to work with. For some strange reason, people are frightened to work with them because of things they've heard about and the things that they've done. And I wanted to work with these young men and show them that education is the key. And what I mean by education, it doesn't mean that you have to go to college, you have to go to university, but just picking up a book and studying something, developing a knowledge of self, and I guess that was part of part that I wanted to do, but also to upskill practitioners that work with young people in our community, because I kind of understood that I can't be the only person in the community that works with these types of young people. So I've always been interested, and those that know me, I know I'm always interested in working with people that want to work with the youths that want to work with our young people in our communities to, to empower them, to enable them to make better decisions in life. So I've done a master's degree, I've done a diploma, and I'm at a point now where, you know, I'm traveling around the world, I'm, I'm supporting people in different countries that speak completely different languages, and how to work with difficult young people, violent young people, young people in gangs, young people that have fell out of education, people that are in prison, people that want to come out of prison, people that are, have come out of prison and want to re-engage back within society. And I'm finding myself that because I made that decision to go through education, I'm in a position now where I'm able to travel and do what I want. And I guess my message to all of the people out there, male and female, young and old, that you don't have to come to university in order to be educated. We all know that when you look at some of the most significant people of old, just look through the timeline of the history of all the people that have come before us, not all of them went to university. I'm here now because of, I made a choice that I wanted to go through this path because I wanted to do things different. So now I work at a university, I'm in a space now where I can shape the curriculum, I can shape the way people learn. So when people come to college, when people go to university, I'm in, a position where, I'm in a position where I can shape the way that people learn. Because when I think about my experience in secondary school, that school was institutionally racist because that school did not provide the activities, did not put people in place that was willing to support many people that were like me. I only discovered when I got to university that I was severely dyslexic. When I got to university, I discovered that I was dyslexic. And that explained all my difficulties. And I'll never forget this. I remember being in maths. This was probably about year eight and year nine. And that was probably one of the main reasons why I switched off. I remember speaking to a teacher. And I remember I couldn't understand the equation that she was giving me. And I remember I asked her the equation. She must have gave me four different ways of explaining this equation. And she went like this. And I'll never forget that. Because at that particular point, that was like, you're saying to me that everything I've taught you, you can't hear, you don't understand it, so therefore there's nothing else I can do. And for me, that, for, for maths in, in general, I switched off from maths, and I've always had difficulty in maths since that particular point because I've been unwilling to go back to it. And actually, when you track with a lot of the young people that have fell out of education, a lot of it is bad experiences. I remember teachers used to say to us that, that we're going to uh, go to prison. I remember teachers saying that we're going to end up like drug dealers, etc, etc. And I would love to see the head teachers and the teachers at Hardmore Newman School. They've all probably scattered to different schools now because I said the school closed in 2001. And I'd love to show them what I'm doing right now. I'd love to tell them that most of the things that you told us was incorrect. But there was mentors in our school. I do remember the mentors and I can't forget those mentors in the school that tried their best to support us in an environment that wasn't really supportive of young people that came from my background. And... 
Again, in conclusion, that, that's all I would just really say to anybody that's watching this, that again, my story is not unique, you know, um, I strived, um, you know, I chose, it took six years for me to get to the point I am right now, six years in education, I remember losing hours of sleep, going to the library at mad hours of the night, I remember going to the library, so finish work at 10, finish work at 9, get home for 10, eat food, and then I, at midnight, I'd be on the bus going back to university to go into the library and study, and then leave at seven o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, sleep for four hours, go back to work, and that used to be something I used to do all the time, but you've got to want that. I've always been a person that, if I'm interested in something, I want to do a project, I want to get something um, out of education, I just get it done, I don't wait, um, but I always lean on mentors, I always lean on people that have got more experience than myself, I always lean on people that are gonna support me, through that particular process. And now this time next year, I wanna start my PhD. You get what I'm saying? So for me, it's not too late to go through education. Now you don't have to go through the way that I've gone through education, but ultimately what I'm saying is you gotta want better for yourselves. You know, educate yourself, knowledge is key. Education is key. Malcolm X once said, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. And what I get out from that quote is for me, is that, no matter where you are in life, no matter what you're doing, you always can pick up a book and try and educate yourself. There's always somebody that knows a little bit more information than you that you can use to try and educate yourself. So get on it, educate yourself. Knowledge is key, knowledge is power. It's real action, youth in motion. It's about turning real talk into real action. Peace.